Saul's height matches his love of status and power to impose authority, while David humbly accepts his low status and allows God to exalt and deliver him. So people's physical appearances are symbolic. Yeah, very often. Like Esau's hairy body fits his animal-like behavior, and Jacob's smooth skin matches his deceptive, slippery nature. What other clues do we get about biblical characters? Well, often people's names symbolize their role in the story. Abraham in Hebrew sounds like father of a multitude. Jacob means deceiver. Ruth means refreshment. And Saul, his name means the one asked for. He's the flawed king that the people requested. So by packing all this meaning with very little detail, biblical stories can do a lot in a little space. And they even leave out things that modern readers want to know about these characters. Like they rarely come out and tell us people's thoughts or motives. Right, like when Moses saw an Egyptian beating an Israelite, he kills him on the spot. But why? Was this righteous anger, or did he just lose his cool? And was it okay with God that he did it? Yeah, we're not told. Because biblical authors usually avoid giving moral commentary. They would rather have a character's words and actions reveal their motives and then leave us to judge their behavior by seeing the consequences. So in the case of Moses, this murder is the beginning of a pattern of his anger getting the best of him with bad results. This choice forces him to run and hide in the desert for 40 years. So it was a bad thing. But he does meet his wife out there, so it's a good thing? <laughs> exactly. It forces you to ponder. Through all these techniques, the biblical narratives keep their story compact, memorable, but also engaging. But seriously, was Moses being good or bad? Right? Like in classic stories, there's always a good guy and a bad guy, some admirable hero who faces off against some horrible villain. Sure, and simplified characters like that are helpful for teaching children there's such a thing as good and evil. But the Bible's not a children's book. Its characters are very complex, a mixed bag of good and evil just like us. There's hardly any flawless characters in the Bible. What about heroes of the faith, like Abraham or King David? So you mean Abraham who used an Egyptian slave for sex and then lied about his wife two times to save his own neck? And David, the man after God's own heart, who sleeps with another man's wife and then murders him? These stories are anything but simplistic. They offer us realistic portraits of compromised people like ourselves. The real surprise is that God keeps working with them despite their failures. So, just because a person's called by God or wins a battle, becomes successful or wealthy, doesn't mean the biblical author wants me to act like them. Right. It would actually be really dangerous to imitate most biblical characters. True. But there must be something admirable in biblical characters, something I can imitate. Absolutely. Pay attention, and you'll notice that most biblical stories highlight the moments when characters fail or come to the end of themselves, and then they choose radical trust in God's grace and wisdom. It's in these stories that the authors show us how to be a human who truly pleases God through humility and surrender. Yeah, the fact that God stays committed to biblical characters is a profound statement about the patience and love of God, who is also a character. Right. And by studying biblical characters, we can observe our own worst tendencies on display. And we see time and again God's gracious response that will see this story through to the end. Isn't that good? Mm -hmm. I'll watch another one here. Okay. Yeah, so their flaws teach us so much. Like we talked about last week, um, if you were, as a parent, if you had perfect kids, there were so many things that we wouldn't know about you. If you were patient, if you are fine, if you were just in your discipline, all of those things. So luckily, the, the characters are very flawed, just like we are. Um, and so we learn so much about God that we otherwise would never learn. Dale Roth Davis one of my favorite commentators, he says, the church must understand that God's plan and God's kingdom will come because God will see to it and not because we are such outstanding members of Jesus' varsity squad. Right? It's not about us. Let's talk about dialogue for a second under your characters. The stories have this rhythm between narrative and dialogue. Okay, so they're telling the story and then they're actually telling you what the characters are saying. They're talking to each other. Um, and there are some things to pay attention to. The main thing to remember here is that the first point of dialogue from a main character in a book, the very first time that they speak, is often a very significant clue to the character of the speaker. 
okay? And then the first point of dialogue in a whole book is often the point of the whole story, okay? So the first time you hear a character speak, that tells you a lot about their character. And then the first instance of dialogue in a book often tells you the, like what the whole book is about, okay? Um, let's look at, turn to Ruth. We looked a little bit about Ruth, uh, at Ruth last week or two weeks ago. Ruth 1, Ruth 1, okay, we talked last week about this story, so it starts out with this terrible tragedy, Naomi's husband and her two sons die, um, and then we read the end of the book, uh, where Ruth and Boaz marry, Ruth has basically become Naomi's daughter, and the whole story follows Naomi, and at the very end, it's talking about how she is blessed and um, how God has blessed her. So, the first point of dialogue is in 1.8. Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Okay, the whole story is really about this kinsman redeemer. Boaz is a like a type of Christ who, um, again, like we talked about, God is working out his beautiful plan, even in the midst of the terrible times of the judges. Um, so the, the book is, is a, some people think of that book as just a love story between Ruth and Boaz, but it's not. It's a love story about God coming for his people and rescuing them. Um, turn over to Nehemiah 1. Nehemiah. Let's start in verse 1. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month of Chislev, in the twentieth year, as I was in Susa, the citadel, at Hanani, one of my brothers came with certain men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, see the, see going back between the story and dialogue. They said to me, so this is the very first point of dialogue in the story. The remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. Okay? The entire book of Nehemiah is about Nehemiah going back and leading the people to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. Okay? That's what the book is about. So you see there um, what the book is about. And Nehemiah, I wrote this down somewhere. Where go? Nehemiah's first point of dialogue is in verse 5. And I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses saying, he keeps going on and on and on. So this is his first point of dialogue. What what does that tell us about his character? About the type of person that Nehemiah is? First, what's he doing? Praying. He's praying. Nehemiah is probably, if I had to pick one biblical character that you should pattern yourself after for prayer, it's Nehemiah. What else does this tell us about his character? He's weeping and mourning. Yes. Yeah, he understands. He, understand. he understands. Does that make sense? He cares. Well, he cares about the about the Yes. Yep. God's place. God's people. Absolutely. Anything else? Is he arrogant? No, not at all. He's praying even for himself. He was a godly, godly man, praying for the sins of all of Israel, including himself. In that. Okay. So. Always look at the first dialogue from a character. It tells you a lot about them. I'll have you guys do that in the homework this week. I'll have you looking at um, David and Goliath, one of my favorite stories. A story that's t typically interpreted incorrectly. You're going to learn to interpret it, interpret it correctly. Um, so look at those things. Okay, plot. Let's talk about plot. The stories are structured. Remember, we talked about the importance of seeing the structure of a book. Through the plot and the events selected are shared for their meaning. 
Okay, seeing structure in the narratives is pretty easy. Like, we're going to study Jonah. Jonah has four chapters. First chapter, Jonah is called by the Lord to go to Nineveh. He says no, gets on a ship, goes the other way. God sends a storm. They throw him overboard. He gets eaten by a giant fish. Chapter number two, he's praying in the, in the belly of the fish. Chapter number three, he's vomited out on dry land, and he goes to Nineveh and does what he's supposed to. Chapter four, he's mad at God for showing steadfast love and faithfulness to the Ninevites. Okay? That's your structure of the narrative. It's easy. Once you get into the New Testament letters, it's a little, compli- a little more complicated than that. But your structure is the story. Um, the story is told in such a way to get the point across. Again, stories are told on purpose. There was one day my kids had been over at my parents' house. I think it was Reagan. I can't remember who it was. Um, and they were telling me, I was like, what y'all do today, blah, blah, blah. And they said, Paul, which is my dad, Paul told us the story of the little boy who cried wolf. And I was like, oh, yeah? What were you doing right before that? <laughs> right? Stories are told on purpose. Um, and what you're going to note is the proportion. Often an author gives more space to what is most important. Okay, think of the story in like Genesis. We just went through Genesis with um, Jeremy. Think of like the story of Joseph. Joseph's story is a big part of the book of Genesis. So the author is giving a lot of focus on that. So you need to pay attention to what the author is focusing on. Um, think of the Gospels and how major portions of them cover just the last few days of Christ's life. Okay, so giving weight to what's most important. Note also that historical narratives are not concerned with chronology or sequencing. Many of the books aren't even written in chronological order. Okay, this really gives people heartburn, like in the Gospels, because they'll say, well, this Gospel says that after he came down from the Sermon on the Mount, he healed a leper. And that one says when he came down from the Mount, he made the blind man see, or whatever. Okay, so it gives people heartburn, because they think it's supposed to all fit. But... Hebrew narrative, especially, they're not concerned with that. It doesn't matter to them. They don't feel like you need to, they need to tell a chronological story. It doesn't matter. They're telling the story in a way that unfolds who God is to their audience, in a way that their audience can understand it, and in a way that gets their point across. Okay? So don't get heartburn when you know it's not in chron- Judges is not in chronological order. The stories of the different judges are put, like I said, in such a way to show you this giant spiral towards sin and idolatry. It's awful. Um, Norman Perrin says the natural function of narrative is to help the reader hear the voices take part in the action and get involved in the plot and this is really the part that's supposed to make us wise again like I said we're kind of supposed to feel that tension of the plot and the characters and think is this the right course of action why can't they just trust God how many times do you want to just thump an Israelite on the forehead when you're reading right Like, can you just trust God he's like literally told you this a hundred times and you still can't do it and then you have to realize Hasn't God told me things a hundred times and I still don't trust him? I still want to do my own thing, right? Um, Again, because we have to figure this out in our everyday lives too. We're we're faced with all kinds of situations and circumstances that we have to decide what is wise. And again, what is um, the biblical direction to go? Um, Another point to make here for both plot and characters, the Old Testament stories reflect the culture in which they were originally created. And that culture is very different from ours. Um, even the New Testament culture, we must understand their culture to understand their writings. We've talked about this before. This is why we answer our exegetical questions. Okay? Who wrote it? Who did they write it to? I don't want you to just tell me the Israelites. Okay? You can say that on every single one of the Old Testament books. Who who they write it to? The Israelites. Okay? (laughs) Tell me what you know about the Israelites. Okay? If you don't know anything about them, that's not helpful. You need to know about them, their culture, the cultures around them that they interact with. Um, a good commentary or a Bible dictionary, again, Blue Letter Bible, will help you here tremendously. Um, because, again, we need to get into the shoes of the original audience and see and understand these books the way that they would have understood them. And then, again, we need to remember that a book's individual stories connect to the overall theme of that book, which then connects to the overall theme of the Bible, okay? Keeping everything in context. We don't pull individual stories out and say, what does this mean? You look at it in... The author wrote it for a purpose. He's typically unfolding a story on purpose. Where in the story does that happen? That's all important. Okay, we'll practice this stuff. And again, lastly, we are not looking for the moral of the story. We're interpreting to find the meaning, those timeless truths that bridge from then to now. And often the meaning in the narratives is what it teaches us about God. That's often what the meaning is. 
And then when we consider application, we can think of the question, how did the author want the original audience to respond to what he was writing? And again, a lot of times, it's the author just wanted them to trust God. Just do what he said. Right? It's not that hard. Setting. Let's talk about setting. This is where the story takes place. As we've already seen in our observation practice, we looked at this in Ruth and noticed that that setting is, is super important. Um, locations and directions are a big deal. Um, even when something is happening is a big deal. We talked about time words. All of that stuff are, uh, they're all very important. Let me, let me just, we're gonna watch there. Uh, Bible Project has an excellent video on the setting. I'm gonna show it to you guys. In every story you've ever heard, the action took place somewhere, and that place is called the setting. And since we've been learning how to read biblical narratives, let's talk about how settings work in the Bible. So, settings are a crucially important tool in the hands of the biblical authors. Really? Yeah, think of it this way. When you start a story, everything is new. The plot and the characters are a mystery until things unfold. Yeah, we have no idea what to expect. Except, authors can use the setting of a story to prepare you for what's coming. How so? Well, let's say a story begins in a courtroom. What do you think is going to happen? I expect a story about crime and justice. Yeah, or how about the setting of a dark, old, rundown house? Oh, something scary is about to happen. Exactly. So settings evoke memories and emotions because of other stories you know that happened in similar places. The authors know this, and they can use settings to generate expectations about what could happen in this story. And a good author will get creative with settings, and he'll mess with your expectations in order to make a point. This happens in the Bible? All over the place. For example, think about the setting Egypt in the Bible. Yeah, big Middle Eastern empire on the Nile. <laughs> now think about the first biblical story where someone ends up in Egypt. It's about Abraham. God calls him to journey by faith to a new land, and he promises to give him a huge family. So he sets out, but he arrives during a famine. Now, is he going to trust God and stay in the promised land, or will he leave the land and go look for food on his own? Yeah, Abraham leaves and goes down to Egypt. And there, in Egypt, things go downhill fast. Abraham denies that Sarah is his wife to save his own neck, and then Pharaoh tries to marry her for himself. Okay, first impression of Egypt, not a great place to visit. But God then rescues them, he strikes Egypt with plagues, and so Pharaoh relents and sends Abraham away with loads of wealth. So, what do we learn about Egypt as a setting from this story? It's the place people end up because of stupid decisions, but it's also a place where God comes and rescues his people. Yep, and the next main story in Egypt follows the same pattern. Abraham's great-grandsons make a bunch of stupid choices, and they eventually lead them to Egypt because of another famine. Down in Egypt, uh-oh. So generations pass, and the family ends up as slaves in Egypt, and what do you think is going to happen? God's going to send some plagues and rescue his people. It's like he saw it coming. After the Israelites get back to the Promised Land, God tells them to never go back to Egypt for any reason. It's the place of trouble and oppression. So when future biblical characters go to Egypt, I'm supposed to cringe. Right. Like Solomon, at the peak of his wealth and power, he married the king of Egypt's daughter, and then he started sending Israelites there to import Egyptian stouting. And then, a generation later, that alliance goes bad. Egypt oppresses Israel all over again. So biblical settings carry with them all these memories of previous stories, which create expectation. Yeah, it's a brilliant literary device to infuse stories with meaning. Now, biblical authors, they're brilliant. They can build up your expectations, but also creatively mess with them. Like how? Egypt's a perfect example. In the Gospel of Matthew, when Jesus is born, his family flees to Egypt. Uh-oh, so this is a problem. Hey, you would think so, but pay attention. Instead of Egypt being the bad place, it's the place of safety. Because who are they fleeing from? King Herod, who is behaving exactly like Pharaoh did, but he rules Jerusalem, not Egypt. 
Matthew is messing with me to show how Jerusalem has become Egypt. Exactly. You can find these kinds of patterns in many different biblical settings. Babylon, Moab, the wilderness, Bethlehem, the list goes on. <clears throat> Which is a big list. And it gets bigger. Because sometimes the setting isn't just a place on a map. It's a type of situation. But they work the same way that settings do. For example, when people move toward the east, expect trouble. Adam and Eve were banished to the east, and then Cain wanders to the east. People move to the east to build Babylon. And all of these narratives are designed to point forward to when the Israelites as a people will be exiled to the east in Babylon. Ah, yeah, nice. Which leads to one more type of setting in biblical narrative, and that's time, or how long events take. Like, time periods of 40 are often associated with stories where people's faithfulness is tested. Noah in the boat for 40 days and 40 nights. Then he gets off and gets totally drunk. The Israelites got impatient during their 40 days of waiting for Moses on Mount Sinai, so they made the golden calf. Or after the Israelite spies investigate the land for 40 days, the people rebel, so they have to wander in the desert for 40 years. But then there's the story of Jesus, who was tested in the desert for 40 days, and he reverses the expectation. He overcomes the test. Exactly. Across the whole Bible, places, situations, and time periods become full of meaning by evoking memories and setting expectations. And the New Testament authors reuse all of these settings to show how Jesus is the one carrying our world from the garden, out of Egypt and the wilderness, and into the new creation. Okay. <clears throat> so I have given you guys in your stack of handouts. This little sheet right here. Title What Do Numbers Mean in the Bible? Numbers are very significant in the Bible. It is no accident. Anytime you come, come across numbers, it's no, it's no accident. Um, and they represent different things. This is really good to stick in your uh, Old Testament tab so that you can use it anytime you come across numbers, or really the whole Bible, but Old Testament is where you see this a lot in the narrative. <clears throat> and use this to see, uh, like the number 12, what are some things in the Bible that you can think of are 12? Tribes. 12 disciples. Anything else? I can't think of anything else right now either. Um, means governmental perfection. What about seven? What do you think of when you hear seven from the Bible? Creation. Yeah. Means completeness. Completeness or spiritual perfection. So these are really helpful, as you're saying. They're, they're really, really cool. Um, and again, they're not on accident. Everything in the Bible is exactly as God wanted it um, to be. So it's very cool to see. Okay. Um, what else did I want to talk about here? Okay, reading with God at the center on your hand out there. God is the main character and always the hero, whether he is mentioned or not. Again, because we said the Bible is a book about God. We are to read with a theocentric focus. One crucial thing to keep in mind when reading Hebrew narrative is the presence of God in the narrative. Okay, He's either present and we can see him. So we'll see things like, um, they'll say, the narrator will say, the Lord was with Joseph, the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, the Lord sold him into slavery for disobedience. Um, you saw in the first Samuel homework on Hannah where he said the Lord had closed her womb so she was unable to have children. Um, so he's either present where we can see him, or he's like in a supervisory role where he seems absent, but we can still see him working. Okay? In biblical narrative, God is the ultimate character, the supreme hero of every single story. So he is always there in some way. Okay, We were working on, in our practice sheets that we were doing, working on having you guys highlight and mark the names of God. Well, there are some books where you will not mark any names of God. We're going to walk through Esther here in a second. God is not mentioned not one single time in the entire book of Esther. But you will learn so much about him by reading the, the story of Esther. Okay, So you will sometimes not be able to just go through and like look at all your marks and make a list for who God is. You need to reread the story and with a theocentric focus saying, what is this teaching me about God? and reread it and try to pull all that out. Okay, so turn in your Bibles to Esther. I love the book of Esther. 
several years ago, I was the Sunday school lesson that I was supposed to teach from. We had like a book that we were using. It was kind of walking us through the Old Testament, and it got to Esther, and my lesson was supposed to be on the importance of public speaking. And Esther, and I was like, no, I'm not teaching on the importance of public speaking. Like this book is such a beautiful picture of God's providence, of God's preservation of His people. Looking at the importance of public speaking, the fact that Esther was went in front of the king and said what she needed to say is not the point of the story at all. So, let's talk about what the point of the story is. Um, so Esther, where is it in the timeline? Where what can we know about this? Just right off the bat, just where it is in our Bibles. It's historical narrative. Yes, it's right before the 400 silent years between the two testaments. Anything else? Esther was written, and I had a little chart. Well, actually, you know, I had a little chart that it kind of messed up. Um, so Esther is actually written. So Ezra is divided into like um, chapter. <laughs> I can't go back over there at the second point. <laughs> Esther, can you not turn? No. <laughs> <laughs> Esther is divided like into two parts, basically, it's like chapters one through six, and then seven through whatever it is. I don't remember. Um, or Ezra. Did I say Esther? Esther is actually written right around here. Okay, in the Hebrew Bible, these two Ezra and Nehemiah were the same book; they were combined, and so Esther was placed at the end because Esther kind of occurs like right in the middle of those two. So now it, it lands right here at the end, but really Nehemiah is historically the last, like the end of the history of the Old Testament. Okay, look at Esther one. So this book takes place, again, during the exile. So the southern tribe of Judah was taken over by Babylon. They burned Jerusalem to the ground, took the exiles to Babylon, and they were just basically assimilated into Babylon culture. They weren't necessarily war captives, but they would not have been like respected people of the society, okay? Um, <clears throat> So these, the people in Esther, would have been the Jews who did not return. In the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, Ezra and Zerubbabel, Ezra opens up with a man named Zerubbabel. It's hard to say his name. Zerubbabel led a bunch of people back to Jerusalem. God moved the heart of the king to let them go back and rebuild it. Zerubbabel, Ezra, and Nehemiah led groups of people, about 50,000 of them, back into Jerusalem. But most of the people stayed in Persia. They didn't go back to Jerusalem to rebuild. Ezra is all about rebuilding the temple, whereas Nehemiah is all about rebuilding the city and the wall. Okay? So, consider that. These are the people who did not return to Jerusalem to rebuild. They just stayed in um, Persia, Babylon, and then Persia overtook them. Okay, so, chapter 1, 1 through 3. Again, I'm just going to kind of walk you through the story of this book. And I want you to kind of pay attention as we're going through, like, what is this teaching me about God? In a book that never mentions God one single time, we can learn a whole lot about him, okay? Ezra 1, 1, now in the days of Ahasuerus, the Ahasuerus who reigned from India to Ethiopia over 127 provinces, in those days when King Ahasuerus sat on his royal throne in Susa, the citadel, in the third year of his reign, he gave a feast for all his officials and servants, okay? There's a whole lot of important information right there. We'd have a lot of clocks, a lot of um, geographical locations to figure out what, what is all this stuff, okay? And this shows us this is a real story. This was a real man who really reigned in Persia at a specific time. Um, the history books tell us this king was a total loose cannon. He was a terrible, um, what did it say what I was looking at? He had no manners in war, it said. He would take the heads of the captured kings and put them on stakes at the palace gate. Um, he once had a bridge built, and there was a storm that came through, and it knocked the bridge down, so he rounded up all the engineers and the builders and, and decapitated all of them, mm -hmm. killed them all. So he was a loose cannon, very difficult, uh, very brutal type of man. Um, verses 5 and 7, I want to read these to you, and I want you to see how this would be a perfect time to say, why did the author just tell me that? Okay, verse 5. And when these days were completed, the king gave for all the people present in Susa the citadel, both great and small, a feast lasting for seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace. There were white cotton curtains and violet hangings fastened with cords of fine linen and purple to silver rods and marble pillars, 
and also couches of gold and silver on a mosaic pavement of porphyry, marble, mother of pearl, and precious stones. Drinks were served in golden vessels, vessels of different kinds, and the royal wine was lavished according to the bounty of the king. Again, you should be asking, why did he just give me all of that detail? It means something, okay? There's nothing in God's word that doesn't mean something or not on purpose, okay? So it means something. Um, so what happens here, the king made his queen mad, okay? He's having a, a drunken feast. He requests King Vashti to come in her birthday suit and dance around in front of all his friends. And she says no, so he removes her from being queen anymore. <laughs> So then he decides to have Bachelor Persian edition and go through and have his men round up all the virgins in the in the town and brings them to parade in front of him um, for and Esther is actually rounded up at this point. Um, it is in this chapter, later in this chapter, we're introduced to a Jew named Mordecai. We find out that he is a descendant of Saul. So he's Jewish, okay? You know that when you're reading the Old Testament, you're always trying to distinguish who's Jewish, who's not. It's hugely important. Um, so we find out that he's been raising his cousin Esther, who was very beautiful. So she got rounded up. She doesn't tell anyone that she's Jewish. Turn to 2.16. 2.16 says, And when Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus in his royal palace in the tenth month, which is the month of Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign, the king loved Esther more than all the women, and she won grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Okay? So this is... Ahasuerus was... His Greek name was Xerxes, the king Xerxes. He was the king of the most powerful nation on the planet. He mm. literally ruled most of the known world at this time. Okay? And he just appointed a Jewish girl as queen. Like, that is like, their readers would have been going, what just happened? Like, what in the world? Okay? So, a Jew had just become queen of the most powerful nation on the planet. Mordecai, Esther's cousin, who told her to keep the relationship on the down low, would hang out at the palace gate. And one day, he just happened to overhear a plot to kill the king. Let's look at 219. Someone read 19 through 23. Now when the virgins were gathered together the second time, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. Esther had not made known her kindred or her people as Mordecai had commanded her. For <laughs> Esther obeyed Mordecai just as when she was brought up by him. In those days, as Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Big Ben and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs, who guarded the threshold became angry and sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. And this came to the knowledge of Mordecai, and he told it to Queen Esther, and Esther told the king in the name of Mordecai. When the affair was investigated and found to be so, the men were both hanged on the gallows, and it was recorded in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. Okay, turn over to chapter 3, verse 1. Here in the story we meet our antagonist, his name is Haman. After these things, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, and advanced him and set his throne above all the officials who were with him. And all the king's servants who were at the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage. Then the king's servants who were at the king's gate said to Mordecai, Why do you transgress the king's command? And when they spoke to him day after day, and he would not listen to them, they told Haman in order to see whether Mordecai's words would stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew. And when Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage to him, Haman was filled with fury. But he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone. So as they had made known to him the people of Mordecai, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews, the people of Mordecai, throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus. Okay, this is hugely important. So, Haman gets placed as the highest of the officials in the king's palace, but we're given, we're given a huge clue here. Do you, did you catch it? Does anyone know what the huge clue is? Why is it that Mordecai would not bow down to him? Because he, he worships bow down to the Lord. Okay, that's part of it, but Haman was an Agagite, <coughs> otherwise known as an Amalekite. You know any stories about the Amalekites in the Old Testament? The Jews were supposed to destroy them. Yes. Yes, the Jews were supposed to, because in Exodus 17, 
God sends the plagues. They go out from Pharaoh, out of Egypt, and their very first battle is a group of Amalekites coming up against them. Um, the Amalekites were descendants. Amalek was grandson of Esau. So if you studied Esau in your homework this week, you know how important that is. So they came against them. They came against God's people at every single turn. And God, because of that thing that happened in Exodus 17, says, you're cursed, you're, I'm going to wipe you off the face of the earth. And he wanted his people to do that. He told Saul to do it. Saul disobeyed and didn't completely do it like he was supposed to. Samuel ended up taking King Agag and cutting him up in pieces because Samuel actually did obey the Lord in that sense. Um, so these are the enemies of God's people. Just in that one little word, if you know who the Amalekites are, the original audience would have been like, oh, no, it's an Amalekite. Okay, Haman's just gotten put in charge and he's an Amalekite. This is not going to go well. Um, so saying that they hated each other is a massive understatement. Okay, um, So that is why Mordecai would not bow down to him because they didn't like each other. Because Haman can't stand Mordecai, not realizing that he's related to the queen, he goes to the king and he says, There is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from those of every other people, and they do not keep the king's laws, so that it is not to the king's profit to tolerate them. So if it please the king, let it be decreed that they be destroyed. Okay, All through the Old Testament, we see the enemy trying to completely wipe out God's people. He's still trying to do it today. Think of the Jewish Holocaust. It still happens today. Satan wants to wipe out God's people. Okay? Um, and here it is again. So they sent letters out to all the kingdom with instructions to kill all the Jews on a certain day in the future. The king said, okay, sounds great. I'll put my seal on this letter. They sent it out and eat it on X day. Whatever Jew is in your province or territory, kill them. Okay? So Mordecai hears about this, and he tells the queen. She mentions that she could be killed by showing up in front of the king without being invited. But Mordecai reminds her of some very important things. Turn over to four. Chapter 4, 13. This is probably the most famous part of Esther. 4, 13. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, Do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Okay? So... They're relying on God's promises. They know that God has promised to preserve his people and that that's what he's going to do. And if you don't do it now, we're going to die and he's going to do it some other way. Okay? So that's what he's saying, basically. So she decides to risk her life and public speak in front of the king, which is not the point of the whole story, um, because she knows about God's promise. And she, not surprisingly, it says she won favor in the sight of the king. He tells her, whatever you ask, I'll do. So she basically just says, I want you to invite Haman to a dinner. She's going to kind of fill the situation out, try to decide how to break the news. Um, so she invites them to a banquet. In the meantime, we learn a whole lot about Haman. Turn to chapter 5, verse 9. Someone read 9 through 14. Haman went out that day happy and in high spirits. But when he saw Mordecai at the king's gate and observed that he neither rose nor showed fear in his presence, he was filled with rage against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman restrained himself and went home. Calling together his friends and Zeresh, his wife, Haman boasted to them about his vast wealth, his many sons, and all the way the kings had honored him and how he had elevated him above the other nobles and officials. And that's not all, Haman added. I'm the only person Queen Esther invited to accompany the king to the banquet she gave. And she has invited me along with the king tomorrow. But all this gives me no satisfaction as long as I see the fat Jew Mordecai sitting at the king's gate. His wife Zeresh and all his friends said to him, Have a pole set up reaching to a height of 50 cubits and ask the king in the morning to have Mordecai and tailed on it. Then go with the king to the banquet and enjoy yourself. This suggestion delighted Haman, and he had the pole set up. Okay. So 50 cubits is like 75 feet-ish. Okay, so very, very tall. 
gallows and these weren't like um, hang them from a rope this was like put them on a stake kind of a thing very ugly okay so he builds these gallows for Mordecai but it just so happens there's a lot of stuff in this book that just so happens such a coincidence <laughs> that very night that he's building gallows for Mordecai the king couldn't sleep okay so he asked his servant to read him the book of Chronicles, that book that it said that they wrote down Mordecai's name in, that we read the verses there. Um, he just so happens to hear the story of Mordecai, and he remembers that he never actually rewarded him for what he did for saving his life. So let's look at, um, where is it? Six. Six, three. And the king said, what honor or distinction has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? The king's young men who attended him said, nothing has been done for him. And the king said, who is in the court? Now Haman had just entered, this part is my favorite. Now Haman had just entered the outer court of the king's palace to speak to the king about having Mordecai hanged on the gallows that he had prepared for him. And the, young, and the king's young men told him, Haman is there standing in the court. And the king said, let him come in. So Haman came in, and the king said to him, What should be done to the man whom the king delights to honor? And Haman said to himself, Whom would the king delight to honor more than me? <laughs> and Haman said to the king, For the man whom the king delights to honor, let royal robes be brought, which the king has worn, and the horse that the king has ridden, and on whose head a royal crown is set, and let the robes and the horse be handed over to one of the king's most noble officials. Let them dress the man whom the king delights to honor and let him lead him on the horse through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Then the king said to Haman, Hurry, take the robes and the horse as you have said, and do so to Mordecai the Jew who sits at the king's gate. <laughs> Love it. Leave out nothing that you have mentioned. So Haman, I want you to see what this part, this part right here, the narrator just does not give us any of the juicy details we really want. <laughs> so Haman took the robes and the horse, and he dressed Mordecai and led him through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. <laughs> I want that whole story. Like, was there a smirk on Mordecai's face? You know there was. Like, I want that whole, I want all the details right there, but we don't get any. So we know they're not important. Okay, so that very day, Esther finally tells the king that Haman wants her people killed. And the king hangs Haman on the very gallows that he built for Mordecai. That's what you call justice. Look at chapter 8, verse 1. On that day, King Ahasuerus gave to Queen Esther the house of Haman, the enemy of the Jews. And Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had told what he was to her. And the king took off his signet ring, which he had taken from Haman, and gave it to Mordecai. And Esther sent Mordecai over the house of Haman. Um, back in 7, I think I missed this. It says, where is it? Basically, Hang, uh, Haman was killed, so was his wife and all of his descendants. So it's at this point in the Bible where the Amalekites are done. God does what he promised, wipes them out, they're goners. Okay? Um, so then the king releases an edict saying that the Jews can defend themselves. And then it says in 9 1. Now in the twelfth month, which is the month of Adair, on the thirteenth day of the same, when the king's command and edict were about to be carried out, on the very day when the enemies of the Jews hoped to gain the mastery over them, the reverse occurred. The Jews gained mastery over those who hated them. Then it says later on, no one could stand against them, for the fear of them had fallen on all the peoples. They were a small people in this giant place. Okay, so you know God is behind you. You know that that's that's a God thing. Okay, so now let me see the whole picture in that book. What what do we learn about God in a story that never mentions him? There's some scholars who originally argued that Esther shouldn't be in the Bible because it didn't mention God. They felt like that was, and I'm like, oh, that was not do that. Shows that he's true to his word. True to his word. Keeps his promises. He's always at work behind the scenes. Always at work behind the scenes. Yes. Yes. What else? His favor for his people. Favor for his people. What else? He accomplishes it no matter how bad it seems. Yes, against all odds. Yep, absolutely. Anything else? Those are all excellent. 
And then we might want to ask questions like, what what purpose did the author, for what purpose did the author tell this story? Okay, these events, I showed you when the events actually happened, but the book of Esther was thought to be to have been written during the, either right before the 400 silent years or during the 400 silent years. And right before would have been the events of Nehemiah. And in Nehemiah, the whole story, like, like I said, was about them going back and rebuilding the city amidst all kinds of um, oppression from the people around them. Like the enemy was working really hard to keep them from rebuilding the city. Um, and again, they were able to over overcome with the Lord and, and rebuild. But think about the 400 silent years, how seeing a book where God is, God is not speaking directly to people, but they can see his hand moving so well behind the scenes. Would they have needed to know that in those 400 silent years? They would have need, needed to know that God is still working. He's still carrying out his plan, even though he's not speaking. We're not hearing from him. From him. I think that time would have been really difficult for the Israelites. They probably thought they screwed it up, but they needed to see that they can't. They can't screw it up. Um, we can see how God works in the seemingly normal events of life. You know, a king can't sleep. Um, a sinful man is filled with rage towards God's people, literally, literally builds his own gallows. A king just happens to fall for a Jewish girl. Is there anything that God cannot do to accomplish his plans and purposes? Do we sometimes miss seeing him work because we think it has to be like the, the Red Sea? Right? Do we see that God works in the very easy, everyday stuff? Okay, and that's part of how the Old Testament helps us. We can see how God is working around us because we can see it in his word. Um, we see God's purposes prevail, like you guys said. Um, the preservation of his people um, and then extinguishing the Amalekites like he promised. My study Bible says, Esther can be compared to a chess game. God and Satan, as invisible players, moved real kings, queens, and nobles. When Satan put Haman into place, it was as if he announced check. God then positions Esther and Mordecai in order to put Satan into checkmate. Ever since the fall of man, Satan has attempted to spiritually sever God's relationships with his human creation and disrupt God's covenant promises with Israel. While God was not mentioned in Esther, he was everywhere apparent as the one who opposed and foiled Satan's diabolical schemes by providential intervention. And then he quotes um, Psalm 121.4, Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. So God is the unseen power controlling everything and leading everything in that way of his purposes and plan. Um, and again, the people need to learn to trust God that he's going to carry out. He can, what is it, the king's heart is in the hands of the Lord. He moves it whichever way he wills, right? He's in control. He, If he wants his plan to be accomplished, it will be. So the theme of Esther is how God sovereignly preserves his people in accordance with his covenantal promises to Abraham. We see this remarkable weaving together of God's story to redeem his people generation after generation. So we can know that God takes the same great care with our stories. Okay, will the enemy ever defeat God's plan? No. no, he won't. So when the New Testament tells us that we are kept until the day of redemption, that his promises will come to pass and we can have great hope, can we believe that? Yes. Yeah, we can. Okay, that's the way we can apply apply this. Um, in the same way that the characters aren't the point in the narrative, they only serve to display the glory of God and the plan of redemption, we're not the point right now in God's plan of redemption either. Um, is life about us? It's not. Our significance comes in how we point to Christ and how he carries out his plan that he includes us in. And we should be in awe of that. Okay. Um, let's see. Other things in narratives. <coughs> Again, we start the observation process just like we do in any other book you guys have in your stack. Two things that I wanted to show you. This exegetical questions for narratives. So walk you through the, the questions that you want to answer before you study a book. Again, who wrote it? Um, to whom was it written? When did the events of the book happen? And when was the book actually written? And that's important in the uh, narrative. What genre is it written in? Obviously it's narrative, but just remind yourself of what's some of the key things that we want to remember. And what's the purpose and what's the theme? You can keep those and have that um, put that in your narrative tab. 
And then this one, in interpreting historical narratives, is kind of like just like a little cheat sheet to remind you of some of the main things when you're reading narratives of what to pay attention to. So stick that one also in your narratives tab. We're already talking about that one. And then your homework. I don't have the homework on this guy. Oh, yeah. I gave you two different ones. We will not have, that was long. we will not have class in two weeks, um, October 12th, because that is fall break and we have no, there's nothing here at the church that night. So we will not have class that night. Um, so that will be a good week to get caught up on some homework. Um, so this week you guys have, this Exodus goes with this, the attributes of God. They printed them separately, so you might have them separate. Each that these go together. The attributes of God and Exodus homework. This, I basically have you just start reading through Exodus and list what it teaches you about God and what you learn about man. Two ways that you should be focusing on what you're reading. And then this historical narrative is the one where I have you um, in the story of David and Goliath and interpreting that story correctly. I have some stuff I wanted to go through on Judges, but I'll just make a homework thing on it for next week. Oh, a couple of books that I wanted to recommend, and then we'll be done. Um, this book right here, Graham Goldsworthy, is one of my absolute favorites. It's a teeny tiny little book. It's called Gospel and Kingdom. It's about, it says, a uh, Christian interpretation of the Old Testament. It's really, really good. And again, I'll set these over there, and you guys can look through them if you want to. And then this one... I've told you guys Del Rock Davis is one of my absolute favorites. He writes a lot of Old Testament commentaries. He just came out with one on Luke um, also. But um, this one is called The Word Became Fresh. Subtitled How to Preach from the Old Testament Narratives. Don't ignore that. That's an unfortunate subtitle. It's not about preaching. It's just about finding meaning in the Old Testament narratives. This book is a very good, like you need to have your Bible out. Because he'll mention a passage and then he'll just talk about it. He doesn't really like list it. So have your Bible out. Look at what he's talking about, and then um, let him walk you through how to find meaning in that passage. It is excellent. This is one of my favorite books. Who was it? Dale Ralph Davis. I could put a picture of these on my group me. So, two very good books um, that will help you in Old Testament so, narratives. Any questions? Another question. Yes. So, you had mentioned how, or maybe the video mentioned how the name, the people's names, like, mean something about their story. Yes. So how did they, like, get the name when they're a baby, like, that means what their story's about? Uh-huh, because God is in total control of everything in the whole universe. And that's how, that's how numbers work also. Like, a man can have 40, can't, you know, like, it's, it seems random, but there's nothing random in the Bible whatsoever. We were watching a documentary today. We're studying astronomy with my kids. And this documentary was talking about what is the star of Bethlehem. And he was they have software that they can, because it's all a mathematical equation, they can go backwards and look at exactly when they think Jesus' birth was and see what it was that the star of Bethlehem was. It's like two planets that align and it's part of the lion, the constellation. Which it was the coolest documentary. But he was talking about how... When God put the stars in the sky, the, clock, the stars are like a clock. Like they just, they function, they're constant. They just do the same thing all the time. So he was saying, when he put the stars in the sky, he knew the exact moment that Christ was gonna come to this earth and those were going to align. Like all of it is, it's all, my old pastor used to say, it's all rigged. Like it's all, <laughs> God is in total control. He knows the end from the beginning and it all works. And that's what, that's what is so stunning about scripture because you start to see that in the bible when you see names that mean a certain thing or numbers it's it just is all a picture of him being in total control of everything that happens so that's a good question any other questions okay let me pray for us next week we will talk about uh, the law uh, books which are in the first five books there's when you know how to study the law, what still applies to us today, what does not apply to us, how do we know the difference? Um, and then we may go into prophets. We'll see. I haven't decided what we're going to do yet. Okay, let me pray for us, and then we'll go. Lord, we're so thankful for your word. We're so thankful that we can come to know you, um, that you are sovereign, that you are um, provident, that you did not spin this world into existence and then walk away from it, that you are an active agent in every single thing that happens on this earth. And we're so thankful. We find so much comfort in that. 
Lord, I pray that you would just continue to give us a hunger to study your word, that these women would um, take the things that we've talked about and really um, know how to apply them, and as they study, that they would remember the things that they're learning. And Lord, most of all, that you would show us yourself in your word, that we would understand the meaning of the things that we're studying, and um, that we would know how to walk those into our lives and become more like you. Um, in, name I, in your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you.